for a series of six chinny notes, the 1UP carries with it a lot of emotion. Accomplishment of beating a challenge, getting one step further away from that looming game over, the list goes on. There's a lot to talk about how games can communicate to us with positive reinforcement, like rewards and incentives. But I've looked and no one's talking about the other side of the coin. Failure. And I find that weird, because failure states have such a profound impact on the way we think, and more importantly feel, about different games. And don't you worry, that wasn't a bait and switch, 1UPs are a really important part of that too. Failure states can encourage experimentation, make us scared, allow us to revel in destruction and so much more. Don't believe me? Well allow me to explain how we find the fun in failure. When looking at how a game handles failure, there are three factors you need to consider. Frequency, flexibility, and intensity. I um, tried to come up with something that starts with F for that last one, and I couldn't. Sorry. By changing up these three variables, games can get you to play in a certain way. Let's start with frequency, because it's the most straightforward. How often you fail. In Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, one-time Nazi killing machine BJ Blazkowicz has been laid low and injured for spoilery reasons. By the way, uh, minor mechanic spoilers for the later parts of the game from here on out. He was hurt to the point that he spends the entirety of the first level in a wheelchair. The game makes a point of showing just how vulnerable you are by halving your maximum health relative to the previous game, as well as making enemies much more aggressive and flanky. Deaths come thick and fast in the first half of the game, and you learn to play cautiously engaging in hit and run tactics and making use of your damage absorbing armour to survive. Even then you still feel vulnerable, because even successful fights will deplete your armour and leave you seconds away from death. Oh look, there it is. By making you die over and over in rapid succession, you feel weak and disempowered. To the point that I'd argue the game works too well, it gets really frustrating at times. But this is also the game can turn everything around at the halfway point and massively increase your health to turn you into an unstoppable killing machine. I only died maybe once or twice after this happened, and it was a total power trip. Remembering how much I died before made the last few levels that much more exhilarating. Of course, having infrequent failure states doesn't mean they stop mattering, quite the opposite. They end up really sticky in your mind. In slower paced, more cerebral games like StarCraft, an actual loss is comparatively rare, and happens in only 50% of games. And even then, after 10-20 to 20 minutes of play, though for me I guess the figure is closer to 75. That means when you are overrun by zerglings, it feels like a big deal. StarCraft is a game about iterative improvement of micro tactics, macro build orders and metagame knowledge. So by keeping losses far apart and giving you space to think about how your strategy failed, each one can represent a clear learning experience rather than having them blur together into something that's much harder to analyse and learn from. Frequent deaths are great at teaching players how to behave on a more impulsive, fear based level. But by keeping them far apart, players have the freedom to use their higher reasoning to learn more actively from their mistakes, but whether they have the freedom to do so and what effect that has comes down to flexibility. Flexibility is a measure of how absolute your failure system is. For example, in games like Super Meat Boy or any number of intensely frustrating platformers, losing is a matter of a single mistake. One wrong move, and you're dead. These games are frustrating because they actively resist experimentation and trying to think outside the box. You play the game's way, or not at all. This leads to an experience that's frustrating, yes, but also one that's a visceral white knuckle test of all of your skills that feels fantastic to overcome because you didn't, and couldn't, take the easy way out. On the other hand, platformers with lives have an intermediary failure state between the absolute one of a game over, and health systems like Mario's power-ups and Sonic's rings add another layer in between as well. In fact, one of the things that both Mario and Sonic do really well is challenging different skill levels of players thanks to their flexible failure states. New players, or just people who aren't so good at the game, need extra lives to cushion the inevitable mistakes they make, whereas stuff like power-ups will let them get past tricky areas. The key here is that while they get more attempts, the challenges themselves are no less deadly and that fear of failure is still implanted. This is where 1UPs come in. Extra lives are highly sought after by new players because they give them even more chances not to fail for real, and they're cemented in the mind of the player with triumphant audio cues like this, this, and the one you heard at the start of the video. This association with being the antidote to failure is really important, because it carries over to when you're much more experienced and actually don't need the extra lives anymore. A lot of the best platformers like Sonic Mania here 
gate extra lives behind finding secret areas or collecting a bunch of coins slash rings slash whatever. No first time player would ever be able to do this reliably, but if experienced players don't die very often, why give out lives as a reward? Well that's because the association of lives as important still matters, letting players still feel like they're being rewarded for mastering the game, even if they might not actually need the lives for anything more than getting through those tough optional challenges and experimenting with finding those secrets in the first place. Rather than extra lives becoming your keys to beating the game, the number you've managed to bank becomes something of a badge of honour, showing how little you died. If these games had a binary success game over state, then they'd alienate new players and have no challenges to offer masters on a second playthrough. Furthermore, there's a final failure factor to fastidiously foresee forthwith, and friends <coughs> uh, sorry about that. I'm talking about intensity, namely how intense of an effect failure has on the gameplay experience. Sundered takes failure in a really interesting direction. Even though it has more in common with your Metroidvanias, it takes failure state inspiration from roguelikes. Dying in Sundered has such low intensity that rather than being something to completely avoid, death is a part of the natural gameplay loop. Here's how it works. You journey into the twisting ruins of this big old cave, killing monsters, smashing boxes and all that good stuff. As you do so however, swarms of enemies will intermittently appear and as is tradition, try to murder you. Each one of these swarms is bigger and nastier than the last, and have more and more of these glowy green things up for grabs. Eventually you'll be overwhelmed and sent back to the hub, which is the only time where you can spend that currency in order to get stronger before going out again. It forms this awesome cycle of adventure, improvement and progression that fits really nicely alongside the more traditional Metroidvania design elements and also the pseudo Lovecraftian themes. By having failure be a part of the gameplay loop rather than something that interrupts it, you give players this great sense of seamless progression and growth rather than having character death represent a roadblock in the way of progression. This tactic also sees a lot of use in games like Ziggurat, where every death punts you right back to the start. Unlocking bonus items and things to do on subsequent runs really takes away from the sting of losing your progress and actually incentivizes you to play again in order to see it. It's tactics like this that actually left me feeling weirdly optimistic about dying because I get to see what cool new thing was up for grabs. Here I was literally seconds away from beating the final boss and I got sniped out of nowhere and died, but instead of smashing my face into the keyboard in rage, I was instead just super interested in trying that new character I just unlocked. In making death quick and a part of the regular flow of gameplay, you can get players to embrace or even encourage it, but what about if you want to get players to really care about dying? Well then, you've got to draw it the hell out. In roguelikes, death has very little consequence and as such you don't really care about it, but in games like Hollow Knight and less important games with bad remasters called Dark Souls from which it draws inspiration, death is shoved in your face constantly. Firstly, the atmosphere of Hollow Knight is so intimately focused on death and darkness that the name of the main town sounds like a really crappy metal band. Alright, in seriousness about 90% of the enemies are zombies, everything is falling to bits, you spend a large portion of the game in a literal dead kingdom, death is everywhere and for a very good reason. Just as Meat Boy reminds you failure is constantly looming over you by punishing even tiny mistakes and having a very narrow threshold between you and death, Hollow Knight conveys this through its visuals and theming. Why? Because when you do die, Hollow Knight really wants you to ruminate on it. Losing in Hollow Knight is pretty depressing. You get shunted back to the last bench sans all of your money and with diminished soul energy capacity. The only way to get that stuff back is to go all the way back to where you died, kill your spirit and pick it up again. Should you die before you get back, the money is gone for good, making your second death even more of a downer. This makes the run back to your spirit super tense, with your previous death constantly on your mind thanks to the practical and thematic threat of the environment. And if you've done it enough so that the regular enemies don't bother you, this run back gives you even more space to think about that bit that is giving you trouble. Then when you make it back, well look, you're right in front of that boss that just squished you, ready to give it another go. The corpse run is a genius bit of design that's actually been around for years, but it is used to fantastic effect here. The run back to your spirit gives you the time you need to meditate upon your shameful defeat, meaning you'll be ready when you come to face the boss again. But why does any of this matter, huh? What if you're a 1337G4M3R, whatever that means, and you're only focused on winning? Who cares about losing when we're here to beat games, right? Uh, it doesn't quite work like that. 
failure is another vector through which games as an art form can communicate to us and give us an interesting experience. When I was playing RimWorld, I got kind of frustrated because I wanted to win and played in a very boring efficient manner, but I discovered I really wasn't having much fun, even when I finally started making some progress. The times when RimWorld was arbitrarily mean and created huge fires or bandit raids were the most fun, and they were when I was losing. That's when I realised that RimWorld's laissez-faire attitude to failure was trying to communicate something to me. Failure in RimWorld is very frequent, with your little society constantly dealing with crazy animals, starvation, fire and all sorts of other things, but it's also very flexible, with a whole wealth of systems in place for injury, mental state degradation and combat that I wasn't really engaging with at all. Failure in RimWorld is to be expected and overcome, not avoided. So I switched things up and started experimenting. I played much more riskily in an attempt to create a cool and interesting stories, like taking live prisoners and trying to convert them, even though I was already painfully short on food, as well as investigating deadly alien hives. That one actually got half my society killed, but it did allow for one of the survivors to be forever immortalised as the saviour medic of the great insect war, and got me some great, rare space heroin. After I started paying attention to how RimWorld wanted me to play, and altered my outlook accordingly, I started having way more fun and now I totally get the appeal. This is why paying attention to how we lose, just as much as how we win is important. Because without doing so, we're probably not going to be experiencing the game as it was meant to be experienced. When you die in a game and feel angry, afraid, eager to try again, or just like the whole thing was actually pretty funny, hold on to that experience. Hold on to that feeling, because chances are it's intentional, and you should use it to inform your play. Whether that's being more cautious, thinking long and hard about why you failed, or just learning to give less of a fuck. Death can teach us a lot. And that is why I lose at video games all the time. See, it's actually deliberate, I'm really, when you get right down to it, better at them than you. Is, uh, is anyone buying that? This video is brought to you by my Patreon patrons. Thank you so much for your support. If you would like to support the channel for the price of a cup of coffee a month, click on that link down there, looking at you people who came here because of the trending page. I'd also like to thank my top tier mysterious benefactors, Samuel Vanderplatz, Baxter Heel, Strateger in Ultima, Dominic Sudlow, Daniel Metzges, Apotropos, Asaran, Brian Notariani, Vodjan Palagora, Asteroid Baby, James Andrew Davey, and Chow. Thank you so much and I will see you all in the next video.